Right, well, welcome everyone to our first program in a, a new series. Uh, of course, throughout the sesquicentennial, we had the brown bags and we were connected to a, uh, to a specific date of, of a year and all that. And uh, now we are changing things a little bit. So our new series is called Lunch and Learn. Same idea though, you're welcome to come bring a lunch and eat and uh, listen to a talk about a uh, topic that has something to do with the Civil War but not directly connected to any specific date. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, John Kosky, who's our historian. And uh, it's very fitting that he's doing this talk here today because we're so close to Belle Isle and that's uh, the topic of John's talk. So without further ado, give John a welcome. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you all for coming today. And of course, this was not accidental to be able to see what we're talking about right over my, my, my right shoulder. That was thought that would be a good way of inaugurating this new Home and Away series. Uh, Lunch and Learn has special significance for this topic, too. One thing you'll learn right away is you don't want to have lunch before you come to one of my talks. And, for, and don't have what he's having. Um, but, and also, I should quickly add that Kelly gave a program two years ago in our sesquicentennial series, a very excellent program on Belle Isle and on uh, Libby Prison uh, during the 150th anniversary of the worst winter during the history of Belle Isle as a prison camp. And I want to assure you, as I assured her, that what I'm doing today is not the same kind of program. So if you're not going to be getting a repeat of what Kelly did so well two years ago. I'll be referring to some of the things that she did talk about, however. So I've, the title, of course, and this is an article that I did uh, in Civil War Monitor magazine. This is going to be up there for a while because I don't have any graphics for the first part of this talk, uh, is death and life. So let's start with death. Always a good topic right after lunch. It's from the Richmond Daily Dispatch of May 13th, 1862. Headline, found drowned. The body of a little girl, six years of age, was found in a fish trap in the James River yesterday below the Danville Railroad Bridge. Her father's name is John Roberts and works at the Belle Isle Foundry. His daughter had been missing since last Wednesday. Not exactly the kind of death you probably expected to hear about today, but wait, there's more, there's much more. From the, Daily Dis from the Times Dispatch, or Daily Dispatch, Dispatch in January of 1886, sudden death. Edward Dean, a colored man about 60 years old, died very suddenly at his post of duty on Belle Isle about 12.30 o'clock yesterday. It was, it was supposed that his death was the result of apoplexy stroke, although no inquest was held. The deceased had been engaged as a blacksmith by the Old Dominion Company for 35 years. In 1904, with a stacked, huge stacked headline, all alone instantly, community shocked by accident, etc., etc., Dragged in a relentless current through a monster pipe into whirling, grinding wheels beyond, Mr. Robert M. Blankenship, superintendent and general manager of the Old Dominion Iron and Nail Works, met instantaneous and frightful death yesterday afternoon in the forebay of the horseshoe mill on Belle Isle. If you've not read the papers from that era, just suffice it to say that they did not flinch in describing the gruesome detail. Words like mashed were common verbs in newspapers of those days. I'll spare you those details. 1906, June, workman buried beneath landslide, aged colored man fatally injured in accident on Belle Isle. Long and the short of it, an 84-year-old man, what was he doing working at 84? Uh, was uh, working on a sand pit on the island with another man. He was crushed and completely covered with a downrush of earth and sand. He was taken to the hospital where he, he died of his, from internal injuries. In fact, these kinds of accidents were so plentiful in these days that the paper would publish a column called The Day's Casualties. Sounds like wartime. In 1945, let's jump forward in 1945, the body of William Ernest Slater, 58, whom two soldiers identified as the man they saw jump off Lee Bridge Monday afternoon, was found yesterday on Belle Isle by city detectives investigating the case. The family of Mr. Slater said that he'd been suffering from a nervous ailment for several weeks. 1952, a welder dies at work, cause of death probed. I won't even go into the details of that. It did end up, he was electrocuted working inside a boiler in the, at the uh, Old Dominion Iron and Steel Company's plate shop. Same year, in December, man fatally burned here on Belle Isle. Uh, John Williams, 68, 
uh, died at the hospital of burns received in an explosion at the Old Dominion Iron and Steel Company on sun late Sunday. He was in his, uh, his watchman's shack and he put oil on the fire to make it flame and it, it blew up in the shack. And finally, more recent vintage, January of 2006, kayaker drowns in rapids near Belle Isle. An experienced kayaker was part of a group navigating the turbulent rapids of the James River in Richmond yesterday, capsized and drowned. Uh, the late morning death occurred as a group of six or eight kayakers approached the western tip of Belle Isle in preparation to navigate the Hollywood Rapids. So dark and bloody ground is what my friend Mike Gorman from the Park Service calls Belle Isle, and that's not even considering uh, the most famous period of Belle Isle's history. There's a lot of death going on between July of 1862 and February of 1865 when Belle Isle was a prison camp for Union prisoners. How many died is not entirely clear. This shot of the graveyard, uh, which is on the eastern end of the island, looking back toward the city. Uh, it was 210 men exhumed from that cemetery and taken to Richmond National Cemetery off Williamsburg Road uh, shortly after the war. But we know more than 215 men died. The official Confederate count, by the way, was 164 as of February of 1865, which we know is wrong because there are a few surviving Confederate documents that showed that 300 men had died during the late fall of 1863 alone, even before things got so much worse after November of 1863 and into the winter of 1864. The exact number will never be known because the records simply do not survive. Uh, the typical estimate of 3,000 Union prisoners' deaths at Belle Isle is derived from the fact, from what we know about the men buried at this cemetery. Uh, roughly 3,200 Union, Union soldiers who died not in battle, but in hospitals around Richmond. And it is presumed that most of them had, were died, had died from Belle Isle, not on Belle Isle, but from Belle Isle in prison in hospitals around the city of Richmond. So if a high percentage of those men buried there in Williamsburg Road were Belle Isle prisoners, the count is somewhere in the 3,000 neighborhood. We do have some accounts of specific deaths of men uh, on Belle Isle from the dozen or actually several score diaries that, uh, from prisoners that have survived. From, from the diary of William Tippett up at the Library of Virginia, a West Virginia cavalryman, October 1863. Last night, two men were shot by the guard. Guards amused themselves by shooting Yankees. It was widely rumored that the guards were actually given extra rations if they killed somebody at the so-called deadline, which is, I don't think is true. Uh, a so soldier named William Dolphin from the 2nd New York Cavalry in October 1863 observed simply, sickly men dying daily cause starvation, as shown in this graphic from uh, Harper's Weekly in December of 1863. And Zel uh, Zelatese Musgraves, a soldier in the 45th Ohio, named a couple of the casualties in November of 1863. David Wilson of Company H, 45th Ohio Volunteers, taken to hospital in Richmond. David Ridgely of Company I, 45th Ohio, died this morning. And lots of other accounts of soldiers being sh shot by guards, dying of disease. I could go on and on with this, but of course I promised a program called Death and Life on Belle Isle. So let's talk a little bit about life on Belle Isle. Don't have much in the way of graphics for this either, but I'm showing you a map now from Lyle Browning's archaeological report. Uh, of where, where the, when the new Lee Bridge was built in the late 1980s. You probably can't see it too well. Suffice it to say all the dark buildings in the foreground there um, where the bridge is crossing is where the Old Dominion, uh, excuse me, the Old Dominion uh, nail and iron works were located at that point in the 1880s. We're oriented here, by the way, the eastern tip of the island where the prison camp is, is up in the upper right, uh, the, where the bridge crosses over from south side, where many of us in this room are from, uh, on, the, on the lower part of, of the island. Um, that's in that lower part, by the way, in this map is where the ironworks were originally and concentrated to take advantage of the wa water power coming down this channel. But by the 1880s, it was quite the sprawling complex. And if you look real closely, you'll see the word dwelling. And also in other maps, you'll see school and chapel. People, in other words, lived on Belle Isle. Don't forget that Margaret Roberts, that six or seven-year-old girl who drowned in May of 1862, had lived on Belle Isle with her father. 
Her father was an iron worker, one of uh, roughly 100 people who lived in company housing on Belle Isle. Uh, looking in the census records and city directories, you find uh, men who were native-born, Irish-born, uh, English-born, puddlers, molders, iron workers of all sorts, and their families and their wives, homemakers, who lived on the island during the Civil War, throughout the 1860s, and, and beyond. It was a, a populated island. The uh, Edward Dean, the man who died at his post in 1886, R.E. Blankenship, the superintendent who died in the horseshoe mill, Alfred Smith, the black man who died in the cave-in in 1906, Golden Lent, the welder who died in 1952, were among the thousands of people who made their living on Belle Isle through, through the Civil War period into the late 1960s. And if you go to Belle Isle today, you'll find it absolutely teeming with life. Thousands of people on a, on a hot summer day, uh, mostly on the rocks on the north end of the island or the, on the south side of the island, but literally thousands of people on Belle Isle living as people live today. It's, it is Richmond's playground. So life has been very much a part of the Belle Isle story as well. But there was living going on amidst the death during the Civil War, too. Here's a map of the prison camp. Once again, we're looking from the north side here to the south side, a, a, a German soldier's map showing the location of the camp on this flat eastern part directly behind me, the old camp comprising about three acres, and the new camp when the population swelled in this winter of 63, 64, extending upstream toward the popular rocks and toward where the, rem where the former location of the cemetery is today. Uh, another couple of acres <coughs> most five to six probably extending directly under the piers of the Lee Bridge today. That was the scene of where these men lived. How many were there? At one time, estimates range as high as 13,000, more than likely 10,000. We have one pretty good hard count by a New York prisoner who, after counting out the prisoners one day, said that there were 9,500, I think, in November of 63. Perhaps, accumulatively, 30,000. They lived uh, in this one wartime shot by Charles Reese of Richmond looking down from the hill that is comprises most of Belle Isle and showing the prison camp below. The men lived in these conical Sibley tents in, in the first year of its, the first six months of its uh, history as a prison camp. Most of the men had these Sibley tents. That had changed by the winter of 63, 64 when not enough tents were available. And some of the men lived, in a manner of speaking, open to the elements in what was a famously severe winter uh, the, uh, with temperatures in the single digits for days and weeks at a time. It was very similar to the 150th anniversary last winter, two, two winters ago, if you remember how famous and cold it was. It was very much the same way in 1863-64. So imagine living on that pl exposed plain without any coverage whatsoever, as these men did. And a drawing done just after the war by Alfred Wode, the uh, sketch artist for the North northern newspapers showing the perimeter of the camp and notice that the perimeter of the camp is no stockade, don't think F troop here. This is the, the walls were simply three foot roughly high berms surrounding the camp. The men, uh, probably slaves, dug the camp uh, by simply taking dirt from the, creating a ditch and creating a wall. And that ditch was the deadline. The inside ditch was the deadline. You cross over that ditch, you will be shot by the guards just as the stockade, uh, more famous stockade at Andersonville, Georgia. Uh, but this was the look of the camp immediately after its evacuation by the Confederates in 1865. And the, once again, this uh, drawing from, um, uh, from Harper's uh, Weekly in December of 1863. The men lived on very short rations, two meals a day, usually, sometimes one meal a day consisting of a small three-inch square of cornbread made with cornbread that was made with the husk and all, very rough ground, not terribly good for the digestion, wormy pea soup, very thin pea soup, and occasional rations of meat. Of course, the civilians in Richmond were having a rough time at the same time, and the men understood that, but still the rations were short even by military standards. The men lived by supplementing their diet by trading their clothes with men who had food, or those who had food trading their food for clothes. 
It was a barter system that was going on in Belle Isle, even though the, the street system that had been laid out originally was overwhelmed by the increased population, designed roughly for 3,000, accommodated more than 9,000 at its height. But there was a street the men facetiously called Broadway, where they did their very lively commerce, bartering all kinds of goods, usually for food. Death and life then provide something of a metaphor, something of a device for understanding Belle Isle's history, not only as a prison camp, but throughout its history. There was a lot of living and a lot of dying going on in Belle Isle, not only between 61 and 65, but from the 18th century, and before that with the Native American fishing grounds, all the way into our own time. We too are part of the history of Belle Isle. And I, Belle Isle is most famous, of course, during the Civil War period. That's probably what drew all of you here today, not to hear about deaths occurring in industrial accidents. Sorry about that. Uh, but most of you are here today because of its Civil War fame. It was a more important place during the Civil War and in the years immediately afterwards than we really appreciate today. We, most of us who live here know that it was a prison camp, but we don't understand just how significant a prison camp it was during the war. We all hear about Andersonville today, but before Andersonville, there was Belle Isle, and I mean that in several respects. These famous pictures of emaciated, starved prisoners from Andersonville, this one that was one of my first Civil War books when I was in middle school, Matthew Brady book, I was transfixed by this photograph of an Andersonville prisoner. He's not an Andersonville prisoner, he's a Belle Isle prisoner. These men starved on Belle Isle and were transferred to Andersonville, or many of the men were released, sort of humanitarian release, allowed to go to, to a camp of parole in Annapolis, Maryland, where they were photographed in this state. And then their, their pictures appeared on a cover of Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper in June of 1864, but the cruelty of Belle Isle and Confederate authorities. To some degree, this was kind of unfair because these men were released because they were doing so poorly. It was to save their lives that they were released uh, uh, as a humanitarian gesture. But a lot of those men who looked something like that, instead of being released, were shipped south beginning in the December 1863 and particularly beginning in February of 1864, shipped south to Andersonville where they died. And a lot of the men at Andersonville who went straight there remarked that the prisoners who came from Belle Isle were without hope, that the men who were captured and sent straight to Andersonville had some hope still. But then the men from Belle Isle started arriving and they said, we're not going to make it. They, they saw what happens to men in prison. They were in such um, a state that it just depressed the whole prison population. So the Andersonville story is largely the story of Belle Isle. And that was known during the war. And that's why Belle Isle figured so prominently into this very uh, important debate over the treatment of prisoners. It was one of the first post-war fights between North and South about the legacies of the war and the memory of the war was about the tr treatment of prisoners. And Belle Isle figured very prominently, as prominently as Andersonville did in those arguments. Belle Isle, I would submit, is the most important Civil War site in what is now the city of Richmond. If you define a Civil War site as a place where men in blue faced men in gray, confronted them directly. Now, Belle Isle at the time was in Henrico County, but it became part of the city in 1870. But where else do you have as many as 10,000 men at a time dressed in blue, now mind you, unarmed men, uh, confronting hundreds of guards, hundred and some at one time, Confederates? Nowhere else but Belle Isle, which is why I would call it the most significant Civil War site in what is now the city of Richmond. More on that later. But Belle Isle uh, has also been, um, and I'm going to make sure I don't lose my place here and get off the, um, yeah. there are competing claims to, Rich, to Belle Isle's history, which is what my talk today is based around. We know it is a Civil War site, but we need to understand that it was a lot of other things and continues to be other things throughout its long history. Competing claims to its history. It's not just a Civil War site. It's other things equally. It's an industrial site. I've given you some feel of that already. But it, don't think in terms of mom and pop industry here. It, its industrial history goes back very far. 
This is a railroad that was built across the lower channel of the James River in the 1850s to allow railroad transportation from the Richmond and Danville, later Southern Railroad, across to Belle Isle to feed the growing industry, the iron industry on Belle Isle, to give it that essential railroad access to be a successful business. Uh, and this bridge, of course, was absolutely critical. It was a bridge by, that connected Belle Isle to Manchester, to the south side, and then over other railroad bridges further up downstream to uh, the city of Richmond itself. Without this railroad bridge, Belle Isle would not have been serviceable as a prison camp. No industry, no prison camp on Belle Isle. One has to precede the other. The industry goes back to the 18 teens and involves some of the most notable names in Richmond history, Broken Bro, Harvey, McFarland, the founders of this, uh, the Belle Isle rolling mill, uh, that this one remnant from the earliest industry, probably going back to the 1830s, even before Old Dominion iron, nail and iron works. Uh, oldest continual iron fact work from the 18 teens and 20s into the 1960s in Richmond's history. And it was, as I mentioned earlier, an extensive pro uh, proposition it was. Fueled, of course, by water power. And you can get down on the south side and see the, uh, this is a, la a later vintage, but the, uh, the canals that fed the, the water system that made Belle Isle such a, a prominent industrial location is its water power located where it is on, in the river, in the largest island in the James River. Uh, so water power was absolutely critical to the history of Belle Isle. And the iron works, the iron and nail works, were operating during the war. The nail works were among the largest nail works in the country, providing quality nails, uh, 75,000 barrels or so a year, uh, some of the finest nails being produced all and sent all over the country. And they continued to operate even while it was a prison camp. Old Dominion iron, Nail and Iron continued after the war, expanded from the south side over into the plain that was during the war at the prison camp. So by the 1880s and 90s, the prison camp area was also being used as a prison camp when the camp, when the ironworks freed itself from water power and was using um, steam power instead, and later even uh, fuel, uh, oil, for some of the industries on Belle Isle. This is the remnant of the 20th century uh, rolling mill that we see today, also marking sort of the eastern end of the old prison campsite. And the so-called uh, Chrysler building that we see today, the remnants of a Chrysler building, some named because it made tank parts under contract with Chrysler Corporation during World War II. Belle Isle, uh, Old Dominion, iron and nail, nail and iron, and iron and steel matured into the jet age. The last thing it was making when it was closed in the late 1960s, among the last things, refrigeration parts for jet engines, you know, working with government contracts for jets in the 1950s, and boilers, and steel, and forgings. There was also a forgings plant that made forgings uh, for automobiles and bicycles and tools. This was modern industry, and a huge industry at that. This shot shown, uh, this was sometime between the 1870s and, the and 1909 when that railroad bridge that you see in the upper foreground burned for the first time. Uh, it had railroad connections on both sides of the island beginning in 1873, employing more than 1,000 people. And uh, with iron, with it, uh, a very important industrial chapter for Richmond's history as well. It was owned uh, by some of the more prominent men, uh, uh, Frank J. Gould, son of J. Gould, the, the Civil War robber baron, owned Belle Isle for decades in the late 19th, early 20th century. There were labor strife strikes involving the Knights of Labor. This is an important chapter in Richmond and national labor history. Uh, Joseph Bryan of the publishing fame opened up the Richmond, Richmond Forgings Company in 1906 in a small corner of the island. They quickly outgrew it and had to move out to the Aka Yards. Again, this is not just some mom and pop operation. This was a, a serious industry from the early 18 teens into the late 1960s. And beyond the iron industry. You are familiar, we can look down from the Lee Bridge and see the remnants of the generating plant and the distributing plant of the old Bepco, Dominion uh, water generating plant using that canal I showed you earlier, providing power to the old streetcar line on the south side of the James River. And you see if you go to the top of the, the hill, some of the, the power transmission towers that are still there. And quarrying operations began in the late 19th century. The most famous quarry pond here on the south, uh, on the um, 
northwestern end of the island. Uh, opened up probably after 1901 when Old Dominion itself created a, a subsidiary quarry and ran its railroad line from that eastern plain of the island along the path that you take to get to the north side rocks today it was a railroad line uh, carrying full-size trains. Uh, Belle Isle also had one of the city's marshalling yards for railroads where the trains were assembled and disassembled on Belle Isle. And there's a shot from 1965 that many of you who go back farther than I do in Richmond will remember a lot of the features here, but one of them I want to point out, not only the remnants of what was by then a declining iron industry uh, on the eastern end of the island and the old line of the Lee Bridge, but look at the top of the hill. We see that path going up the, that's a radio tower. There have been two radio towers up on the top of the hill over the years, WRTD from 1937 to 1941, and this one, WANT from 1951 to 1974, and a very famous billboard uh, right in front for Climax Ginger Ale and then later Philip Morris, and the remnants of that little pool that you might be able to see right in front of it, which had, had a reflecting quality on the sign, are still one of the features at the top of the hill uh, on the island. So this industrial use makes, in my mind, it makes Belle Isle, the theme of living, extends it to a different direction. People have made their living and it's also been very much a part of the life of the community of Richmond all the while. And another claim on its Belle Isle's history, in addition to its prison camp years and its industrial history, is that of recreation and relaxation. That's what it is today, of course, a park. But don't think of that as a new thing, hardly. The original English owner of Belle Isle, the founder of Richmond himself, William Byrd, observed in the 1730s, the island would make an agreeable hermitage for any good Christian who had mind to retire from the world. We don't know whether she's a Christian, but she's certainly enjoying her hermitage on the mornings on the rocks. And you'll see, see this a lot. It is a wonderful place to get away because it is close enough to the city, but yet far enough from the city to be this agreeable hermitage. And it has been that role, has had that role all along. A little uh, a park land set aside, that's part of the modern park, of course. Apparently it was even during the thriving industry of the late 19th, early 20th century, it was a pleasant enough place to get away and so little of the island used for industrial purposes. Most of it has always been wild, that people would come across the railroad bridge and take nature walks on Belle Isle, even the height of the, during the height of the industry. Among the couples that apparently came over and took a walk in 1885 were Lillian Madison and Thomas Cliverius, cousins. She was pregnant by him, apparently, and he later murdered her. Uh, the, a uh, very, one of the crimes of the century uh, that just uh, dominated headlines for weeks. And what also dominated headlines were the testimony of the Belle Isle workers who saw them on Belle Isle taking a little stroll, a romantic stroll, and apparently had some kind of argument, and then she turned up missing and dead. So the Belle Isle testimony tells us something about that trial, but it tells me about Belle Isle even as a place of refuge in the 1880s. And by 1909, the owner of the island, uh, the Frank J. Gould and the Williams interests, proposed we're not using much of it. Why don't we turn the rest of it into a park? That proposal in the early 20th century. And of course, plans were made in the 1960s. Carlton Abbott and Associates drafted this plan for a different kind of park with a cog train and a marina. Though we didn't go in that direction, as it turns out. And what really, for my money, was the most important day in the Belle Isle's history, and I was there for the dedication of it in 1991, was the opening of the pedestrian bridge. There had been no vehicular access of any kind, or pedestrian access, except across the rocks since Hurricane Agnes in 1990, 1972, which wiped out bridges on both sides. So for the first time in 19 years, it was accessible at all. And it's what made Belle Isle what it is today as a park a place of, of beauty, looking down on the quarry from the top of the hill, where there's also a Civil War gun emplacement. And of course, wildlife on the rocks. This agreeable hermitage that Byrd wrote about in the 1730s. It has come, become that. Uh, beautiful sunsets from the first break rapids on the western end of the island. And of course, Richmond's beach. Don't try to go out there on a five o'clock on, a, uh, on a, a spring day if you don't want to be in lots of company. And of course, a place of recreation with the skilled bicycle skills course on the southern end of the old prison camp site today. 
It is a place, as I say, teeming with life, but don't think of this as an anomaly. Think of this as something, a role that the island has occupied uh, for Richmond, really since the founding of Richmond and, and William Byrd. But maybe we love it to death, as this article and website uh, reveals. In fact, last year, finally doing a survey, a more sophisticated survey of visitation, the James River Park realized that it is the most visited site in all of Richmond, and Belle Isle and Pony Pasture in particular. So maybe we are loving it to death. But this modern role, even if it is its continuity over the centuries, the modern role seems at odds with what some of us know it best as a memorial site. It is hallowed ground, or should be hallowed ground. And a couple of years ago in, in Kelly's talk, Mr. Uh, Dale Jones, who I got to know, and some of you may have seen an article in the newspaper about him, uh, when he, he makes his pilgrimage over there every year to place some kind of a memorial, uh, b because he believes it's not getting enough respect as a as hallowed ground. and. Um, and he raises a good point. He raised during Kelly's talk a good point, and he, he raises one for all of us today about the use of Belle Isle and, it, and that memorial role in the context of what we know Belle Isle to be. So let me try to address that a little bit today, uh, his 2015 memorial. But it raises in my mind the question of how do we as a people, not only Richmonders, but generally as Americans commemorate our Civil War prison camps. They should be hallowed ground, but we tend not to make them hallowed ground. The cemeteries where the men are buried is hallowed ground, but the prisons themselves are not. This is the grand prize photo winner from the Civil War Trust uh, in hallowed ground. Uh, one of the arguments, of course, is that Belle Isle has been so many things for centuries. It was only a prison camp for you know, less than three years. But then again, Gettysburg was farmland except for three days, and yet we hallow that uh, for all time. It's now a hallowed ground battlefield. Why don't we do the same for our prison camps? Uh, or have we done the same? Now, this is a bad slide of uh, Andersonville, the most famous of all prison camps, and it is a national park and home to the National Prisoner of War Museum, uh, not just the Civil War prisons, but everything to the Hanoi Hilton and beyond. Uh, so it, it is set aside as America's Civil War prison uh, site. But it's not alone exactly, but Elmira, the most infamous camp for Confederate soldiers uh, in Elmira, New York, is now a housing development. The Sandusky, Ohio, Johnson's Island, a, a sketch from one of our autograph, prisoner autograph books, uh, is uh, in an island in Sandusky Bay, Ohio, Lake Erie is uh, similarly a housing development. The cemetery is hallowed ground. The, um, the, the island itself is not. Now, Fort Delaware, and again, a sketch by a Confederate prisoner in our collection. Fort Delaware is. It's a state park dedicated in large part to the prison experience. So it helps to be a masonry fort. You get preserved that way. And uh, Fort Warren in Boston, same thing. Uh, this is changing to some degree. There is archaeological excavations going on in, uh, for, at um, Camp Douglas in, uh, in Chicago and uh, Camp Lawton, Millen, Georgia. There's a rediscovery, I think, even Salisbury, North Carolina. So we're, this is, we're changing now. We're getting more attention to the Civil War prison experience. But when I asked the Civil War Preservation Trust about preserving prison land, they say they have not preserved a single acre at all. And it's just not part of their mission. So in the grand scheme of things, Belle Isle is doing reasonably well. This, we're looking out over the part of the island, relatively narrow segment, three, six acres max out of the 60 acres that was used as the prison camp. And it is the least traveled part of the island, really, except for the, the bike path down the middle of it. Uh, but it's set aside in ways that I'll show you in a moment with a, a tablet placed by the Sons of Union veterans. Again, there's some question about Acres and number of deaths, we just don't know. Just guesstimates and made in all these efforts. And historic signs, markers that have been going up over the, the years. There's several of them now dedicated to the uh, prison camp. So if you go over there today, uh, you will find the camp area somewhat designated and some historical interpretation of it. At least these two, and I think there's one more camp still with some of the photographs that I've been showing to you. So it, there, are, there is sign, there is some effort at commemoration, 
And you can see here the, the area looking down, more or less from that same location where Charles Reese took his photos. And this is a great time of the year to go there, by the way, to get these vantage points from the hill looking down on that camp using that same photograph that from, 18, from the summer of 63. And notice, by the way, the, that little structure to the right, that is a uh, new bike rack placed by some BCU students, might be one of several, uh, trying to, to suggest the shape of the, of the Sibley tents, the tents in which most of the men, but not all the men, lived. And this is the area of the prison camp right off the pedestrian bridge, kept in that high grass to help designate it and to help protect it to some degree. But the prison camp, as I mentioned earlier, has been disturbed a lot by industry. This is from the south side of the island, but you look at this, the belching uh, uh, industrial plant right on the side of the, of the prison camp in this 1906 or so photograph. Thanks to the industry and the slag from heavy industry and thousands of men working there, the ground has changed. And more recently, the building of the new Lee Bridge, which contrary to understanding, the developers basically bulldozed the footprint in the, of the bridge and took away whatever remaining soil there might have been, in part because of all the slag. So this very soil has changed uh, from what it was when it was a prison camp, which may or may not be significant if preserving dirt, as my uh, CEO, Wade Rawls, is always talking about, uh, is significant uh, to you. But I would submit that so Belle Isle is doing better than most camps considering the lack of any resources. There are no remnants, there's no buildings, there never was a wall, the, the berm, the archaeological excavation found a little bit of the ditch, that's it, because it was all wiped out by the subsequent industry. So considering the complete absence of any visible reminders of Belle Isle's uh, prison camp history, we're doing pretty well, I think, in the way we're commemorating it. And I would submit that there's a lot to be said for the, for the diversity of Belle Isle's experience and, enjoy, and the, the diversity of the things that have been there and portraying Belle Isle in all of its diversity, historical diversity, allowing those competing claims each to have a stake rather than setting it aside just as a prisoner of war experience. And let me try to convince you of that. Uh, maybe I've spent too much time there and thought about this a little too much. I mean, you know, that might be your conclusion after I have my, I have my say. But I, 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 I commute across it every day. So I see it a lot, and I've been spending a lot of time on it. And for me, the, the multiplicity of uses and the connection make for some interesting historical connections that make it a more profoundly significant place if you keep your eyes open. This is the shot you've seen before of the bridge across from the south side, uh, the covered bridge at that time, over to the island. This is the way the prisoners were marched across the bridge. Uh, from the, they got off at Manchester the railroad, the Richmond Anvil, and were marched across this bridge to get to the prison camp and all that lay before them. This is the same bridge today, a different bridge, same piers. So when you're going across from Southside, you are taking that long walk that prisoners took to get from the railroad depot onto the uh, Belle Isle and an uncertain future, suffering and death for many of them. It can be pretty profound. Bad shot, but a very bright sunlight. Uh, if you go out there early in the morning, in uh, spring and summer, you will see kids from the Blue Sky Fund, uh, who were a fund made uh, makes it makes it possible for inner city children to experience the great outdoors, whether they want to or not. <laughs> they uh, they get them out there, and this morning they were being counted off and marched literally. Uh, counted off in groups of 10 or 12 and marched off in different directions for different programs. When you read the diaries of, of prisoners, one of the constants, sometimes every day during the winter of 1863, 64, was to take them to that little that side right off the, where the pedestrian bridge empties out today, which was just outside the berm of the, of the prison camp, and they were counted, one to 100, into squads, squatting off, they called it, and they, 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 they were then taken to for their rations. So to hear the counting off, to know that, and to see these kids being counted off and sent off in different directions to different stations as such, again, a pretty profound experience that makes for some interesting connections. And of course, we know it's a recreational site. This was the splash and dash. It's also part of a river rock and extreme sports. So our, athlete, our athletic population, or maybe our 
would-be athletic population trying to get in shape here with the Navy SEALs uh, training. You know, on a given day, it's a great place for exercise, biking, hiking, extreme sports, rock climbing and rock and rappelling, and, the, uh, and particularly running and, and, and exercising and calisthenics. And uh, this was more or less on the western edge of the prison camp. So let me read you one of the more famous quotes from a prisoner, Gilbert Saber of the 2nd Ohio Cavalry, describing what he said was the worst of the cold nights on Belle Isle in January of 1864. And remember, about only 80% or so of the men had tents. So a lot of the men were exposed to these uh, close to zero degree temperatures at night. And what did they do? At about midnight, he said, I could no longer stand my shivering, and he was in a tent, and jumped into the open air for exercise. I shall never forget the scene I witnessed there. The whole camp was crowded with men dashing about, jumping, stamping their feet, swinging their arms according to their, their strength and degree of heat left, uh, left, still left or awakened in them. I joined that throng, clasping my hands rapidly around my shoulders and jumping occasionally to start the circulation in my feet. Men doing calisthenics and exercise, not to try to get in shape, but to try to live. And dogs, dogs everywhere. I love, many of you know I love dogs. And it, dogs are everywhere. And some of you may know where I'm going with this, right? Is, there, is everyone familiar with the dog story at uh, Belle Isle? The story of Sergeant Haight's dog or Major Turner's dog or Lieutenant Boisseau's dog, it, it varies. But the dog stories aren't pleasant ones here. Uh, this, this is, I've um, forgotten the dog's name all of a sudden. My neighbors are going to find that hard to believe. Uh, but a nice Bernese mountain dog. And then right here in the middle of the prison camp, uh, Rosie chasing tennis balls. Rosie would not have lived long, suffice it to say, in 1863 if she had been found there. The stories to which I refer are the stories of, of, of prisoners killing dogs that were owned by the various camp guards that the, they got loose from their, their, the officers and they were made a meal of. And in the most famous incident, Lieutenant Boisseau's dog got loose and the men killed him and were cooking him when Lieutenant Boisseau mentioned, uh, noticed he was missing. And he caught the men cooking him and he made one of the men eat it raw. And the, man, the fellow did it with gusto and said, okay, that's great, you have any more? You know, not exactly the punishment that Lieutenant Boisseau uh, uh, intended to meet out. There are literally scores of these stories, and I would love to be able to trace the genesis and the propagation of the dog stories, as it was simply known in post-war veteran stories, because it says a lot about the treatment of prisoners and their perception of, of how bad things got. And also, for the record, the Lieutenant Boisseau's dog is usually described as a white bull terrier. Oh no, this is my dog on Belle Isle. So uh, we make sure that we never let her out of our sight when we, when we take her over to, to Belle Isle. But Belle Isle still has today the elements that explain its history. Swift water rushing on all sides that made for water power and made it such an inviting industrial location. Swift water that also separated it enough from the, ma the mainland to make it an inviting place for all kinds of things, made it a place of, of hermitage, made it a place for industry, made it a place for, um, for recreation and also a place to have a prison camp. Just far enough and separated enough from the city to make it safe for, as a prison camp, but as you can see from the Richmond skyline then and now, close enough to be of use to a uh, growing uh, in, uh, urban area. The, in other words, Belle Isle has these elements, I think, that are the kinds of things that sort of invite easy cliches and inspire poets, but its history is, is that of contrasts. Beauty and ugliness, industry and leisure, and death and life. That's what lies just across the footbridge a couple of hundred yards from here for you all to go out and explore. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, a little over my time, of course, it's predictable, but questions, please, Larry. Uh, in, uh, I worked for Bebco as a lineman in the summer of 1966 and 1967, and we have had our company picnic on the yes. upper end of that island, and we, uh, maybe where the railroad bridge is, that old picture of the railroad mm -hmm. bridge, it was a low-water car bridge. 
right. they drove our cars right there and drove right up to the upper end of the island. Mm -hmm. There was a picnic shelter and picnic tables, and we had our company picnic up there. Uh, there was a low-level car bridge that washed out in 1972. I mean, you come over from, from the north side as well as the south side over the same piers. The car bridge, if you um, look down from the pedestrian bridge as you're heading back to north side, back over here, you look down to your right, you'll see a steel skeleton of a, of a bridge. That was the car bridge that was the only access, the, the main access until Hurricane Agnes in 1972. So Those picnic grounds were put there by BEPCO uh, in the mid-century, and they were the, the basically the forerunner of Venture Richmond had its annual picnics out there to plan. The, the planning of the James River Park as we know it today uh, was uh, decades in the making, and Belle Isle was always the jewel in the crown. Everything took longer, than it's Richmond politics all over, everything took longer than it should have. Uh, but they were having picnics out there on the island to get people used to the idea of what it could be. So they were using those picnic grounds for city officials uh, as well. well after the mid-60s when you saw it there. Please. Escape stories, yes. There are Confederates say that no one escaped, but they're clearly, they're, they did. And, but, and some tried to swim, some were shot and killed. Uh, there are pretty credible stories of escapes. Most of them are more, uh, not very grand, not very exciting. It was the squatting off which required them to go outside the, um, the, the, the confines of the prison. And it's hard for 100 men to keep track of 10,000 men. And there was boat traffic back and forth and men being taken over to the hospital since there was a hospital on Belle Isle, but most of them were taken to General Hospital number 21, I think it was, and others in the city. And enough traffic back and forth and easy enough to lose track of men that most of the escape stories were guys who uh, managed to get some other kinds of clothing or managed to be number 101 or number 99 and, uh, and just managed to sneak away uh, on one of the boats or get across uh, on the South Side Island. They, they could tell coming in that they were real close to the city called what later became the independent city of Manchester. They knew they were near population centers. And uh, they, they managed to sneak off without having to brave the water. But some did. But not by the hundreds, I'd say, Kelly, scores, dozens, maybe. You, you ran across a few escape stories in your work as well? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them, some, some drowned, some were shot. So the, the hard way was to try to swim. It's possible, and particularly at low water. I mean, when, it, when low water is not that big of an obstacle, particularly if you go to the very eastern tip, that little, that last, well, this scene, this is taken, a, that's frozen right now. That's the east side of the island, frozen two winters ago. You could probably walk across it then. And, and th this is the part of the island on the very eastern tip that was accessible to the men for their water supply, for their bathroom, and uh, for, their, for their bathing, all on that eastern tip of the island, uh, accessible by a wooden fence that was built right through the middle of the camp. Um, but it's, it's that close over to basically over to Manchester where the, you have the SunTrust building there now. Uh, but that is, is a rather placid water as opposed to the swift moving water on the north bank. So at low water you could swim without getting drowned but uh, the, the guards were looking at it after you. But basically having the guards lose track of the prison population is how most of the men managed to escape. Patrick. Has it been inundated? Yes. In fact, um, I have a, a couple of photo, photos from last May. It was inundated. May of 14, I guess it was. Um, but just up over the path. The island, the, the, the plain where the camp was and where the industry was, was inundated in 1972. Camille and Agnes dealt a blow to Belle Isle very much the way it did to where we're standing today at, at Tredegar. The high water during Hurricane Agnes was the worst. That's what washed out the bridges and, and it swept away any hope of the, what was it called, the Adamson Company that, at that point that owned what was, had been the Old Dominion Nail and Iron Works. Uh, that was sort of the final straw uh, for them. But only a couple of times has the inundation extended beyond the path immediately around the perimeter of the island. No, no. The, the ground, though, was very different. It's hard to get a sense. I didn't really elaborate on this, but the, uh, everyone described it as very sandy soil. Hard to tell now 
but the soil, after all the tons and tons of slag uh, that has been in, in industrial waste from iron and steel work, it, the soil has changed. It's a different quality. I don't really know how sandy it is. Low-lying, sandy plain that tended to be very moist. Uh, during the summer of 62, when the prison population, one reason for Belle Isle being what it was, it was never intended to be permanent. It was a makeshift prison from the beginning. Don't build anything because we don't expect us to be a prison very long. Hence the dirt berm around it was all, the, all that they needed. Uh, so that first summer, the men dug their own wells dug them right where they stood, and the soil was that wet. A lot, a lot of lice, mosquitoes were the problem. Uh, but they were able to, between the access to the water on the east end of the island, but particularly just by digging wells right into the soil, suffice for the hundreds and I think ultimately around 3,000 men in prison there at one time in the uh, summer of 1862. So it was moist enough to be able to dig. So the difference then and now really is that it, it seemed to have been lower lying and the soil quality was very different from the hard pack that uh, you encounter today. Please. Oh yeah, yeah, it was the, the river was everything, water source, sewage source. Everything, every pretty much every city was doing that. Uh, ideally, of course, one's upstream of the other. <laughs> if, uh, if that was such a bad winter 150 years ago, it probably was frozen like two years ago, mm -hmm. and some people might have mm -hmm. made it escape. And it seems like if you did, you'd want to write about it later on, mm -hmm. and maybe that's in some uh, libraries mm -hmm. up north or somewhere that you could find yeah. some. I have not read any escapes over the ice. There are some later newspaper stories, early 20th century. I've pretty much gone through all the newspapers. Uh, thank goodness for digital databases uh, to be able to, to go through. Although one thing about Belle Isle, Belle Isle, Michigan, Detroit, Belle Isle, Newfoundland, Belle Isle, Lancaster County, which is a state park, uh, Belle Isle where Sarah Bernhardt died in France. Uh, there's a lot of Belle Isles out there. Uh, so you gotta exclude terms in searching Belle Isle. But uh, there were these, I remember wind columns and apparently frozen over enough to walk across the ice from the north side. It was rare indeed. And I have gone through a lot of those, those memoirs. The memoirs are less trustworthy as you can imagine than the diaries. The diaries are, are much better. There's a, a lot of memoirs of Union soldiers in regimental histories, usually something like my life on Belle Isle and Andersonville, since so many men, men were in them, those two, and maybe the Danville prison as well. So there's chapters on each, and they're, they're, by the, they're by the scores, probably by the hundreds. I've gone through a good number of them, no ice escape stories yet, some swimming escape stories. Uh, and also, for those of you who don't know about Mike Gorman's website, mdgorman.com, a uh, goldmine of information about all, anything dealing with Civil War Richmond. Mike is a, a ranger here at the park and historian, and his site is fabulous and has a lot on Belle Isle, including uh, accounts from the National Tribune, which is the Grand Army of the Republic, the Union veterans newspaper after the war, in which, and he has all the excerpts of, of articles relating to Belle Isle from the National Tribune, uh, dozens of which pertain to the dog story uh, and the details about you know, even one that was who killed Sergeant Haight's dog, and there was a lot of, and then correspondence for the weeks and months following, everyone um, submitting their, their recollection of when, where, what kind of dog it was, and, and everyone remembered it differently. But the National Tribune recollections of former prisoner, northern prisoners are quite valuable, but they are 30 or more years, 30, 40, 50, 60 years after the fact and have to be taken with a grain of salt, as do those memoirs you're talking about. Please. I heard your thing on NPR about the big The prisoner exchange cartel was uh, negotiated in July of 1862 uh, to help reduce the prison populations that were swelling. There, there was not much provision made for prisoners during this war as there hadn't been during the American Revolution. Uh, and it worked fairly smoothly. The idea was you accumulate your prisoners and then eventually you trade them one for one, one private for one private, and uh, by a very a sliding scale that was, was negotiated. The, it fell apart in the summer of 1863 in particular uh, over the issue ostensibly of U.S. colored troops. 
prisoners, which the Confederacy would not treat as prisoners. They were uh, escaped slaves to be treated accordingly, to be sold into slavery, even if they weren't slaves. Uh, if they could be returned to their owner, they would be, if they were escaped slaves. And Union officers who were leading these men were, were not Union officers leading U.S. colored troops. They were white men fomenting slave rebellion and would be treated accordingly. That was on paper, and that was the party line. And the Union, uh, the, Abraham Lincoln's administration would not treat on those terms. So there was, th that was the ostensible reason. There's been a lot of accusation in all this post-war give and take about the treatment of prisoners and who was responsible for what everyone admitted was an awful condition for prisoners everywhere. The Confederates accused the Union authorities of being uh, duplicitous and mendacious on this because the real reason, they said, was, and there's some documents to back it up, that the Union could afford to have its men languishing in prison more than the Confederacy could. So in a sense, telling their own prisoners, we're sorry you're in, in, you're in Belle Isle, but understand you are serving your country very well by being in prison because you're in prison and there's a Confederate in prison at the same time. If we exchanged you, but it would be, it's a lot better. The numbers game worked in favor of the Union. And there are some correspondence between Ben Butler and Grant and others that pretty much substantiate that that uh, Grant was willing to play that game and play those numbers in the interest of having more Confederates imprisoned, knowing that their men, could, they could sustain it better. And in, in the years following the war, there was some talk about uh, uh, trying to console the men who had lived and died in prison, that they served their country just like those men on, at Gettysburg. They, they died for their country on Belle Isle in service, not in vain, but that's part of it, obviously, was trying to consoled these men and the families that they didn't die in vain on some prison pen of, of, of puking their guts out or other parts of their body of diarrhea uh, in horrible deaths. That was an honorable death because they died for their country because they were keeping Confederate soldiers out of the ranks. And, that, and there was, so you can imagine the politics, the small t politics of that after the war in trying to honor these men accordingly and no, we did not abandon you. There was something to it. But yet without admitting that the cover story of the U.S. colored troop exchanges was not the real reason. We're, we still don't know exactly what was going on there, but there's, there's some, some smoking guns or smell of powder in the air that that might have been the real reason was the, the numbers game. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming out. Next. <laughs>